Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm really honored to be with you. And I came today for a very simple reason. Uh, I need your help. That's why I'm here. I've been involved for the last four years now, speaking and traveling wherever I'm asked to try to change the conversation and the culture around mental illness, because we need to. All of you know that, but we haven't done it. We haven't done it for generations. I see it now. I need your help. If I could do it by myself, I wouldn't bother anybody, but I can't. But we could, if you want to help. I'm a baby boomer, not that you ever could have guessed that. And I grew up in a world, sadly, where no one ever talked about mental illness. It just wasn't a conversation anyone felt comfortable having. And so as a kid, I never heard it discussed. And that was true for most of my adult life, by the way. It may be true for you. But I know more about it now. That's why I'm here today. Uh, I grew up uh, just north of Boston. Sorry about that, but someone has to grow up in Massachusetts. And it was me. I grew up in a very middle-class neighborhood. My dad was a high school science teacher. My mother wanted to be a nurse, but her family couldn't afford that. My mom worked in an office in the neighboring town. I live in a very leafy but very middle-class neighborhood. My best friend, when I was 10 years old, lived right across the street from my home. And his father was a graduate of MIT. In my childhood, in my neighborhood, MIT was rock star status. My friend's uncle, his father's brother, never went through high school. He was an inpatient at the Danvers Mental Hospital in Danvers, Massachusetts. Every adult who ever spoke at that place, every kid, including me, used to call it the nut house. We thought that was pretty funny, apparently. Nobody was embarrassed saying that. All these years later, looking back, I think we all should have been embarrassed. We all should have been ashamed. I see that now. But when I was 10 years old, I didn't understand that. And my friend's uncle would sometimes come to the yard, their home on a Sunday, usually in the summer. And I can remember seeing him standing by the side of their garage, looking at the flowers, sometimes walking around the yard. He he never looked at me, never spoke to me, never gestured to me. But I thought he was pretty scary. He was, after all, in the nuthouse. And when he would leave my neighborhood late on those Sundays, on those warm Sunday evenings, I felt safe again. I never had the courage to cross that road, by the way, when he was visiting. I figured they locked people like him up to keep us safe. And in my childhood, I didn't realize that anyone in my town could have a mental health problem. I thought that guy was somehow one off. That's what I thought. And I felt pretty confident, even as a kid, in knowing that I'd never know anyone or see anyone the rest of my life who had a mental health problem. And I was wrong about that. It's one of the reasons, with the help of Dr. Mitzitschak, I spent many waking hours in the last four years speaking wherever I'm invited. I would speak every day if I could. Some decades after that childhood I described, in a different state, namely New Hampshire, in a different community, Manchester, and on a street somewhat different than the one I grew up on. Mental illness crossed that road from my childhood and took up residence in my own house. My wife and I are baby boomers. We didn't know anything about mental illness, so we didn't see it. I had two sons, 11 and 13, that took up residence in my 13-year-old son. He didn't know he had a mental health problem. Uh, Makes sense when you think about it. How would you know just how you feel, how you react to other people or circumstances? But he was suffering. He just thought it was him, and we didn't see it. When he graduated from the eighth grade, I recall it was on a Saturday, and he told us when he woke up that he didn't want to go to his graduation. And we thought he was just being lazy. It was nice weather. He wanted to play. He said, no, you have to go to your graduation. And so he went, but he wasn't really happy about it. My son started smoking in high school in the ninth grade, kept it a secret. We didn't know that. 
He had friends at Trinity High School in Manchester where he went, but not as many as his younger brother, who was two years behind him. My son spent a lot of time in his room with his door closed, drawing. He was a very good artist from a very young age. Today, I would describe it as withdrawing. But I was pretty ignorant about mental illness back then. I'm not ignorant now, by the way. I'm not ignorant now. If you look at the yearbook for the year my son graduated from high school, you'll find his photograph with all the other graduates. But if you look through the yearbook at the candid shots, at the football games, the dances, you won't find him in those shots because he wasn't at those places. I see that now. He was probably home drawing or withdrawing. He'd done okay in high school, not nearly as well as I thought he should. He's really smart. But he did okay. But he always tested really well. And he got into a pretty good college in New York, and then off he went. And I don't know if it's the truth, or maybe it's a rumor you guys might know, but I, I hear that sometimes when kids go to college, they drink. I don't know if you've heard that. It could be true. Sadly, in my son's case, it was true. I can remember hearing his voice on some of those weekend phone calls. I could hear it in his speech. It was alarming. I didn't know he drank. I talked to him about it. He said, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. I don't drink more than anybody else here. And over time, we'd be on that campus, and then his friends would seek us out, my wife and I, to express their concerns about his drinking. He would say, Dad, I don't know why they say that. I don't drink more than anybody else. I thought he must have, but I couldn't prove it or disprove it. My son got a college degree. Knowing what I now know, I have no idea how he did that. I'm in awe of him. And he had done okay, but not great. But he always tested well. He got into a pretty good graduate school in Boston. And then he came home. We were living in Manchester, New Hampshire, and he lived with us to start school. And when he got home, it was pretty clear to us he was drinking pretty much every day. It was pretty alarming to watch it. We'd talk to him about it. He clearly didn't want to talk about it. He'd say, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. We really don't need to keep discussing it. It seemed obvious to us that he had a drinking problem. But we must have talked about it too much because he moved to Boston for the last six months of school. He got a master's degree. Again, knowing what I know now, I have no idea how he did that. He must have willed himself to that degree. And he got a job pretty quickly when he got out of school, which wasn't surprising. He's really smart. He's handsome. He's funny. He's one of the best read people I've ever met. He's a self-taught musician. He had so many skills. He's a great artist. But it was surprising that the first job only lasted six months. But he said it wasn't his fault. He lost the job. The next job took longer to get and lasted for less time. But he said it wasn't his fault. He lost the job. And then he came home. He was living with us, drinking pretty much every day, trying to hide it, trying to disguise it. He would get some part-time jobs, or hourly rate jobs, but they were never appropriate for someone with a master's degree. He would take graphic design classes wherever he could. He was genuinely talented. But his life wasn't going anywhere. And finally, my wife and I reached out to the alcohol experts and told them what I've told all of you here today. And they, by the way, didn't hesitate. They said, your son's an alcoholic, Judge. That's what's happening here. And you and your wife better deal with that. They suggested we go to Al-Anon classes for family members of alcoholics, and so we did that. My son thought it was ridiculous. Dad, I'm not an alcoholic. If I didn't have these feelings, Dad, I wouldn't be drinking. I would tell that to the alcohol people, and that didn't dissuade them either. Judge, every alcoholic has a reason they drink. Your son's an alcoholic. 
And at the end of the day, he said to us, you're going to have a choice to make, and here it is. You can put your son out, literally out of your house. Hope he hits bottom. Remember that expression somewhere in my childhood. Hope he hits bottom and turns his life around. Or you can let him stay in your house and he's going to die drinking in your house. And we didn't like those choices. And so we persuaded my son, who didn't have a drinking problem, according to him, to go to alcohol rehab. And then he majored in alcohol rehab. It was like the world tour of alcohol rehab. New Hampshire, Cape Cod, Connecticut, and finally he went to Florida. And we were praying that he would have some insight about his drinking. I picked him up at Logan Airport after he'd been in Florida for weeks. And as we were walking to baggage claim, he said, Dad, I had a drink on the plane on the way home but I don't have a drinking problem. So it hadn't taken. And after a while, my wife and I realized that we had to make the decision they told us about. And up to this point, by the way, no doctor, no neighbor, no friend, no family member, and sadly not us, ever said, I wonder if he could have a mental health problem. And so finally, my wife and I anguished. We loved our son. Seemed like we had no choice. And so we put him out, literally out. It was the hardest thing we ever did and the worst thing we ever could have done. It might have been well intended, but it was just gasoline on a fire. He called us a couple of times from the streets during that time, asked if he could come home, and we said no. We said no. He slept some nights at the shelter in Manchester. He ate at the soup kitchen when he was eating. Some nights he slept in his car, and he continued to drink. And I was on the Supreme Court at the time. I'd drive every day from Manchester to Concord, where the court is. And I'd be thinking on the way up and on the way home, and probably for much of the day, to be honest, that we had failed him somehow. His younger brother had a master's degree, had been married, was moving forward, as you would hope. My oldest son, with all of his skills, was going backwards at 100 miles an hour. And he couldn't even see it, and we couldn't stop it. And after three weeks of that agony and dreading that phone call, by the way, that no parent ever wants to receive, we brought him home. And when he came home, he was drinking just as much as when we had put him out. His behavior hadn't changed at all. And I am sure he was scared to death that we would put him out again. And he knew he couldn't go out again. And so one night when he had been drinking, he assaulted me. I have no memory of it, but that's what happened. I went to the intensive care unit at the Elliott Hospital in Manchester. My master's educated, talented, funny, decent son was arraigned in a public courtroom in Manchester before a lot of press. I was on the Supreme Court at the time, so it was a story. He was issued an orange jumpsuit and sent to the Valley Street Jail. I didn't know any of that then, but my wife did. I learned later that it was all over the news at the time, here in Massachusetts. It was written about in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. My doctors actually went on the Today Show to talk about how I was doing when I was in the ICU. Our attorney general in New Hampshire had a live press conference to talk about it. I don't know how my wife dealt with all that. I really don't. She told me later that she visited my son at the Valley Street Jail when I was in the ICU. Can't even imagine what that must have been like. She said they talked on a telephone with plexiglass between them. She said he had his orange jumpsuit on, his ankles were shackled, and he was very upset. He said, Mom, I can't believe I did that to Dad. Just tell me Dad's going to be okay. I can't forgive myself if anything happened to Dad. And in the early days, she didn't know. He said to her, Mom, they don't allow visitors here very often. I think it was twice a week. He said, on days you can't visit, Mom, I can see the corner of the cemetery from my cell. 
If you went to that street corner at the appointed hour that we agree on, I could at least see you. And I would know my family hadn't abandoned me. And so my wife would go there at 3 o'clock, park her car. It was late March, early April, kind of dreary. She told me later she'd get out and wave at the jail, multiple stories. She said, I didn't know what floor, what window, or whether anyone was looking back. She said, I always gave him a thumbs up sign before I left. And she said, I'd get in the car, I'd cry all the way home. I, I don't know how she did that. After about six or eight days in the ICU, I remember being wheeled down a corridor at the hospital. I felt pretty sore. I had no idea why I was in the hospital. So I asked the fellow who was pushing me, he said, Judge, I think you fell. I felt pretty sore for someone had fallen, but I had no memory of anything else, so I accepted it. After a day and a half, my wife and I were finally alone in this large hospital room. And by the way, when you visit people in the hospital, try not to say to them, I love your room. I hated my room. Just try not to say those things. But after a day and a half, my wife and I were finally alone, and she told me as best she knew what had happened, and I, I hadn't fallen. And she told me where my son was, and the two of us just cried. I'd been a judge and lawyer my entire professional life at that point, so I knew what it meant for him, for us, maybe even for his brother. I didn't understand it. If I had any understanding at all, it would have been alcohol when it's abused can take people to bad places. I literally couldn't get out of bed for two days in that room. I couldn't go home with my wife. I couldn't talk to my son. I, I don't know the dictionary definition of hopelessness, but I know what it feels like. That's exactly what it feels like. I wasn't allowed to visit my son at the Valley Street Jail when I got out of the hospital. I would have, but the court wouldn't allow it. My wife would go twice a week. She'd come home crying every time. Finally, friends who had known my son since he was little would take her place just to give her a break. I didn't see him for six months, and that was the day they took him to a basement windowless courtroom in Manchester so he could be sentenced to the state prison. I hope you don't have that day in your life. I would have bet you anything I owned or might ever do or accomplish, I could never have been my family. It was on that morning. It was still a story. There was still press covering it. My son came in that day through a side door with a bailiff at his elbow. It was great to see him. He looked great. He hadn't had a drink in six months. My wife and I stood up in the public row and he gave me a big hug. He said, Dad, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I said to him that morning, if you don't quit, your mother and I won't quit. I'm not sure I believe that, but that's what I said. He said, Dad, I won't quit. And then he was sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in the state prison. I, I don't know how we all didn't pass out, to be honest. He had served six months of the seven and a half at Valley Street. The court suspended four of the seven. The court said, maybe they'll parole you after three years. Not my call, said the judge. But you're definitely going away to the state prison for three years. My master's educated son. The court let us see him for a minute, and then off he went. You're not allowed to visit new inmates for 30 days. They evaluate every new inmate. What are the issues? Where should they live on the prison campus? So it was 30 days before we saw him. We met in the secure psychiatric unit of the state prison. That's not where he was housed, but that's where the meeting took place. We were told that day by the psychiatrist with my son present that he had serious depression, panic attacks, the feeling you're about to die. Panic attacks and anxiety, which the psychiatrist described as off the charts. 
He said, that's why he was drinking, Judge. He was self-medicating his mental illness. And when he said that to us in that place, I knew that we had failed him. I was, after all, a parent. I should have known something about mental illness. I thought all mental illness, by the way, was hopeless. It's far from hopeless. I know that now. I didn't know it on that morning. And so we're going to try to work with him and turn his life around. After four months, he came out on one of our visits twice a week, revisited. 20% of my day job, by the way, was hearing appeals from the very population he was now living with. I wasn't really popular at the prison. That'll keep you awake at night if it's your child. He was very brave about it. After four months, he came out and hugged us that night, as he always did. He said, Dad, I feel so different. I said, what do you mean different? He said, Dad, I'm sleeping through the night. I haven't done that since I was little. I can focus, Dad. I, my mind's not racing. I'm teaching. He was like that for the balance of his time there. But I, I knew we had failed him. He was paroled after three years. I said, they won't parole you. I was Chief Justice then. I said, you deserve it, but it's just not going to look right if they favor the judge's son. They paroled him. He was so good on parole, by the way, that after a year, the parole officer said, I'm going to try to get rid of your parole years that lay ahead of you. He was very excited about that. I said, they, they won't do that because I'm the Chief Justice. But the parole board eliminated the parole. I'm grateful for them. When my son left prison, they sent a camera up that day. We were there, my wife and I. They put the lens in front of me and said, do you have anything you want to say? I said, I do, actually. My son's not a bad person who's now suddenly a good person. He's always been a good person. He's now well. And those are very different things, by the way. My son, who is drinking every day, has not had a drop of alcohol in over 15 years. I know the treatment work. He said, Dad, I could spend the night in a liquor store. I might have a Coca-Cola, but I'm not that guy anymore, Dad. I don't have that tug anymore. So why am I bothering all of you? I didn't do anything, by the way, for a decade. I'm a baby boomer. I didn't want to talk about it. I'm the last guy to be talking about it now, but it's the most important thing I've ever done because I see it now. I got involved in a campaign on the five signs of mental illness, May 2016. I've devoted the last four years of my life to it. When I joined Dartmouth Hitchcock, they added to the campaign, how do you react when you find the five signs? I didn't know how to react, I do now. The day we launched it, we launched it in an empty house chamber in Concord. 400 state reps in New Hampshire, and they weren't in session. We were just going to announce the launch of a nonpartisan, nonpolitical public awareness campaign. I thought, who's going to come to this at 10 a.m. on a Monday? I got there that morning expecting 20 people. 425 people came. It's the most impressive room ever assembled in my four decades in New Hampshire. Three members of the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, the Catholic Bishop, the Episcopal Church, the Jewish community, members of our congressional delegation, our governor, doctors, lawyers, law enforcement, mental health people, and families. It was stunning. And the woman who started the Five Sides campaign, Barbara Van Dalen, asked this question of that room. Does anyone here this morning, she said, who's been untouched by mental illness, yourself, your family, your extended family, your friends. If you've never been touched by it, she said, raise your hand. I was new to it. I had no idea what to expect. Not one hand went up. Not one. Meaning every single person in that room had been touched. I said to her afterwards, Barbara, how's that possible? I said, John, it happens in every room where I ask the question. Just because people don't talk about mental health doesn't mean people and families aren't dealing with it. And she shared these statistics, which I want to share with you. Half of all mental illness in America begins by age 14. 
My own son was 13. Two thirds by age 23. Last year in our country, more than 47,000 people died by suicide. Fenway Park and then some. That's more than died in every traffic accident across our country, by the way. Every 90 minutes, plus or minus every day, including this day, some brave American veteran, he or she, will take their own life. We lose 20 veterans a day to suicide. From 2007 to 2017, the rate of suicide among people ages 10 to 24 increased 56%. Are we okay with that? More police officers died last year by suicide than every other cause in the line of duty. Since that launch, I have traveled over 85,000 miles. I've visited four states, talked to over 110,000 people, 85,000 of whom are kids from seventh, seventh grade to 12th grade. I've hiked hundreds and hundreds of kids with wet eyes and cracking voices who confide in me, someone they don't know and will never see again, merely because they know I won't judge them or shame them or blame them. I wish you could be with me on those mornings. I wish you were standing with me listening to those kids. It's not right how we treat mental illness. Half of the kids to talk to me, confide in me, are getting no help at all. I've hugged too many kids, by the way, who have told me they either want to kill themselves or try. I remember hugging one junior girl at a high school who was a varsity athlete. She said to me, this is the one-year anniversary today. And I thought she might say the day I made the varsity team. I said, the one-year anniversary of what? She said, of my suicide attempt. She started crying. I just hugged her. And she had her head on my shoulder crying. She said, I'm so happy I didn't succeed. I said, that makes two of us. I said, that's not who you are. You know that, right? That's what's bothering who you are. I went to a high school, my very first high school that I recall, right outside of Concord, New Hampshire. It was 9 in the morning. I spoke to 840 kids, grades 9 through 12 in the gym with the 30 or 40 foot ceiling. I was on a riser behind a fixed podium under the basketball net, and there was nobody on the floor. They were all in the bleachers. And I thought, this is not gonna work. They're probably saying, whose grandfather is this guy? And why is he bothering us in our school? But I was there, I had to talk, so I did. I spoke just as I've spoken to you here. And when I finished speaking, there was dead silence. And the principal who was behind me against the wall, near the basketball net, he stepped up on the little riser. And there was no, no noise, nothing, for about three seconds. It seemed like three minutes. And I was thinking maybe they didn't hear me, maybe they don't care what I'm saying. And then almost all at once, those 840 kids stood up and applauded for almost a minute. The principal said, I'm shocked by this. I said, you're shocked. I said, they're not applauding me, I know that. But what they are saying is, I agree with you. Thanks for talking about it. It happens almost every time I go out. I see what I never saw, I understand it now. I also understand that we're not doing what we need to do. We do not have a mental health system in this country. We have some great and talented people in mental health, but we don't have a system. Half the kids I talk to are getting help nowhere. I've had parents say to me, my son or daughter is having a problem. It's going to be four or five months before I can see someone. If they broke their leg, they'd call 911. If you have a young child with a mental health problem, who do you call? How long do you wait? I need your help. I have hugged more kids who are suffering than I knew existed. And I'm going to end with this story because it stuck with me. I was speaking at a middle school in southern New Hampshire, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. 
The sixth and seventh graders were on the gym floor, seated on the floor. The eighth graders were in the bleachers. And I must have looked 10 feet tall to the kids on the floor. It seemed very odd. And I'm sure I was the oldest person I ever spoke to them. And when I finished speaking, I stood by the exit with the principal. And the kids started filing out. And some of them would go by and say, thanks for speaking. Your talk was awesome. He said, six seventh and eighth graders who are saying that. They get it, by the way. And near the end of the rush out the door was a young man who was walking towards me. He extended his right hand and I just reflexively grabbed it and held it. And he said, thanks for coming to our school this morning. I saw you're very welcome. I was happy to be here. He said, I, I want to tell you why I'm thank you. I said, sure, why? He said, they tell me here at school that I'm on the spectrum myself. And your talk here this morning, he said to me, it changed my whole life. He said, can I give you a hug? He started hugging me, this little boy was crying. And my eyes watered too. I hadn't changed his whole life, believe me, I know that. But my guess was for the first time in his young life, he felt comfortable telling someone he didn't know, but he was sure would not make him feel badly about his challenges. He wanted to tell me about it. This campaign mattered to that little boy. Some days I feel like I may be on a fool's errand. Maybe nobody cares about it. Maybe it's just me. And then you have moments like that, or the boy who waited 75 minutes after I spoke to tell me he wanted to commit suicide. And I took him to a counselor before I left the school and he hugged me for coming. You can't have those experiences and go home at night and pretend it's not a problem. I need your help. We need to learn the five basic signs of mental illness. And you'll see them on this video. We need to learn them. We need to talk about it. We need to normalize it. We need to reach out. We need to react to what we should see. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you will change and save lives. They may be lives you'll never meet or know about, but I guarantee you, based on my experience at this point, so many kids are relying on us. And adults, too, by the way. In any event, thanks for listening, thanks for inviting me, but mostly thanks for your help, because I really need it. Thank you all very much for viewing our video today. I am pleased to welcome John Broderick to join to speak to us today. As you've heard, um, Judge Broderick is the Senior Director of External Affairs at Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, and formerly served as the Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Um, just a brief recap of his extensive work is <laughs> for the past four years he has traveled through New Hampshire and Vermont on a mission to change the culture and conversation around mental illness in an effort to destigmatize it. He said it's his most important work he has done in his entire professional career. So now we will open up to questions um, for Judge Broderick who is here with us. Um, I am happy to accept questions via raised hand. We also have some submitted questions via Whova. So if you have a question at this time, please do use the raise hand feature and I will unmute you. Okay. We have a question from Faiza Mokhtar. Faiza, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for, for the presentation. I think, you know, I just want to say it really resonated with me and somebody who suffers from anxiety. It was nice to hear it in the way you presented your story. So my question to you is, how do we make access to mental health care more accessible? Because it's expensive. And whatever is free out there, to be quite frank with you, is not that great. So how do we make it accessible? And then whatever is accessible, 
quality as much as something you would pay 250 a session or something to that effect. Uh, well, th thank you. And thank you, by the way, for telling me about your own anxiety. Uh, that's how change happens. That's how it happens. Uh, one of the psychiatrists at Dartmouth Hitchcock, which is a huge hospital in New Hampshire, uh, has a medical school at Dartmouth College. Uh, he was asked at a recent forum, he's in his late 50s, Harvard Medical grad. They said, Doctor, how would you rate the mental health system in this country? His answer was interesting. He said, well, the way we treat breast cancer today, not 30 years ago, today, uh, we have very good protocols. We get women, and it's mostly, but not exclusively women. We get them in quickly. We have great protocols. We're seeing really good results. I would say today, that's pretty close to a 10 on a 10-point scale. He said, I would rate the mental health system in this country on that same 10-point scale. This was November 2019. I would rate that a one or two. I would, too. He said, we don't have enough mental health people. We don't have enough psychiatrists. Last year, we only graduated 1,000 new psychiatrists in a country this big. Uh, it's immoral the way we've treated mental illness. It is. And it's immoral the way we've treated people who suffer with mental health problems. Uh, one in five adolescents, by the way, one in five has a mental health problem. One in five adults in any given year will have a mental health problem. Many of them are lawyers, doctors, fill in the blank. 50 million Americans react like it's two people. And to answer your question directly, uh, the reason we move the needle on cancer and AIDS is because we finally had the courage to normalize the discussion, to talk about it, to hug people, to embrace people who are suffering, to find treatment that worked. And we do not talk about mental illness like we talk about breast cancer or AIDS. We don't. When I was a child 100 years ago, my mother used to whisper the word cancer to me. That was very common, by the way. And no, no adult in my childhood ever said publicly the word breast. No one said that. Maybe you Hefner said that, but no other adult said it. And now we say breast cancer. When AIDS broke out in the 80s, we thought, who are these people? What are they doing? Can I get AIDS if I touch them? And then Magic Johnson said, I have HIV. I had to leave the NBA. We love Magic. And things changed. Uh, for this to change, the only way it will change is for people to say, my mother, my father, my cousin, myself, mm -hmm. and we're not able to access services, and that's not right. The psychiatrist that I referenced to Jordan Titchrock said at that same forum, we can do so much for people today, but not if they can't access us. Not if insurance companies don't reimburse mm -hmm. mental health people at the same rate, by the way. Uh, some, some two years ago, I met with Congressman Joe Kennedy, now running for the Senate in Massachusetts. He's a very interesting young man, and so he liked what I was doing, and he said, John, I'm fighting to get parity for mental health and physical health. He said, we don't have that, you know? The law says we have it. We don't have it. People push back all the time. And the reason we don't have it is because we're not insisting on it. And that's not a direct and simple answer. That's not a silver bullet, but it's the truth. Unless and until we're willing to talk about it in our house, in our church, in our synagogue, in our town, in our school, in our place of business, won't change. Mm -hmm. That's why I need people's help. Because I see that pretty clearly now. And if it were going to be fixed, there are a lot of bright people in healthcare that could have said, we need to fix this problem. They would have fixed it. They need voices to help them fix it. That's the truth. And by the way, and thank you. I know I'm talking to lawyers, and I love lawyers, by the way. I love being a lawyer. I love practicing law. I loved every bit of it. But I also know that a lot of people in the practice of law are under enormous stress and pressure. It's a high-pressure job, by the way. Uh, I know it because I live that world. And a lot of people who are really gifted, talented lawyers would be tempted because of their mental health issues, anxiety, depression, to self-medicate like my son was doing. 
So it's been kind of a dirty little secret for a long time. And I admired the ABA for doing this study in 2016 and finally casting a light on it. Uh, the numbers are dramatic. It's dramatic among law students. Uh, and we need to be more accepting of that reality. It's not a character flaw, by the way. It's not a personal weakness or a defect. There is no mental health issue that is. You know, my son said to me all the time, he said, Dad, anybody with a mental health problem, I don't care who they are or what it is or how old they are, they have two things in common. I said, what's that? Uh, he said, number one, they didn't ask for it. That's true. And number two, they don't deserve it. That's true. Too. So what do the rest of us do? We make them feel badly about it. We stigmatize it. Change will only happen when people say, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Uh, it's alarming when the rate of suicide for young people has increased 56% in the last decade. Why? Why is that happening? This is on it, but it's not a topic of everyday conversation. It needs to be, and I encourage anyone listening today or watching, uh, lawyers are well regarded. People listen to you, maybe only once, but they listen. Uh, they listen to you, and I think you should use your voices because you have respect. And to speak up, speak up, either for yourself, a friend, a family member. That's how change happens. Thank you. Our, uh, let's see, our next question we have a question from Kaylin Pelletier Koenig. Kaylin, I'm going to unmute you if you want to ask your question. Hi, Sarah. Kaylin Pelletier Koenig, Madison Chapter, District 20, ADJ. Um, so I posted my question on HOGA, but since we're asking, I might as well just ask it. Um, but so do you think it's ethical or appropriate for state bar exams or state, you know, character and fitness committees to force candidates to disclose um, if they have a mental health diagnosis. And um, from personal experience, I, I do have a couple of diagnoses myself. For example, in Rhode Island, they actually make you sign a HIPAA release so they can get your medical records from your doctor. And I, I never should have signed it. I should have fought it, but I was under so much stress that I was like, screw it. And I just did it. But it's like, at what point, if it is okay to ask, I, I mean, I guess if it is okay, is that going too far? Like to have to hand over our medical records to a, a character and fitness committee? Like, if you made it to law school, you think we'd be able to, like, be a barred attorney. <laughs> that, uh, before, uh, I'm sorry, Judge Broderick, before you answer, I think that's a great point that she brought that up because you and I spoke previously um, about putting together polls for this group, and I'm going to launch them now because that is something sure. that Broderick asked me to, to put up. So give me just a second, everybody. I'm going to launch these polls. Um, because I, I'd love to see, especially that question number three, the answer, and then, uh, Judge, I'll let you take it away while everyone is voting. Sure. Uh, I love that question. And the simple answer is no, it's not right to do that on the basis of health diagnosis. Uh, the Conference of Chief Justices in this country, of which I was a proud member for seven years, recently came out uh, with a resolution saying those kinds of questions on character... Yeah. Yeah questionnaires uh, should not be asked. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and very recently in my own state, uh, several law students at the University of New Hampshire School of Law, I was dean there for four or five years, they reached out to me uh, because they had filed a petition along the lines you're saying with the Character and Fitness Committee in New Hampshire. And they said, you shouldn't be allowed to ask people if they have a mental health issue that might interfere with their practice of law. Most people don't know the answer to that, but they feel intimidated and they should at least say yes if they have ever had a mental health diagnosis. The next question is, please sign the authorization so we can get your records. Uh, it's one thing to ask about conduct if you've been arrested. But it's not okay to say, have you ever had a mental health problem? It, it bespeaks the prejudice that has been going on for generations. So I joined with them. They asked me if I'd write a letter. I did, uh, saying this should cease. It ceased now in about 12 states. And the Character and Fitness Committee 
uh, apparently passed it on with a favorable recommendation to our Supreme Court, which in short order agreed that it should no longer be asked. Questioning conduct and behavior is one thing. Questioning a condition, which as I pointed out, might affect one in five adults, and it probably affects more lawyers than that. And there are people every day who suffer anxiety or depression, uh, who are amazingly talented, decent people uh, who may be getting treatment that's really successful. Um, and so I think it's a bias and the prejudice of a bygone era. Like if you had a mental health problem, that meant you couldn't possibly do responsible work or counsel people or advocate for people. Um, so I think that change is coming. Even the Justice Department has said, the Federal Justice Department, they have very much concerns about that. It seems discrimination uh, in plain sight. So the law students should be each time one the case. Those questions will no longer be on our character and fitness questionnaire in New Hampshire, and I'm proud of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. Uh, I think it's interesting to see. Um, it, Interesting that question two and three are relatively split, but number one is pretty clear, and I think that speaks to some of the things you were talking about, Judge Broderick. Um, we have another question from um, Adam Dotzler uh, from Buffalo, and I'm going to unmute him and so that he can go ahead and ask his question of you. Sure. All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yes. You're good. Good. Uh, Good afternoon, Your Honor. Adam Dotzler, a Buffalo alumni chapter and Alden chapter. First off, I want to say thank you for what you're doing, um, especially like a, me coming from a culture where uh, if you were a man, you were told to either A, suck it up, or B, that's, or B, like uh, be a man, or some other like comment like that. So thank you for what you're doing to like bring this out into the open. And my question, though, has to do with uh, how do you approach someone? who's like, a, whether it's a friend, colleague, family member, who might, have a ment who might have a mental illness, but they are just not willing to talk about it or admit it. I know that's like a, for some people, especially if they're someone older, someone a little bit more conservative or something like that, they, uh, it's not something that you can easily talk about. So I'm willing to hear any advice you'd be willing to give. Thank you. No, uh, first of all, thank you very much. And, uh, and you're right about that, by the way. And the reason uh, they're not willing to talk about it is they're ashamed of it. And they believe that they need to deny it because they don't want to lose friends or they don't want to lose their job or they just don't want to lose the general respect they have. Uh, and, and, you know, for many years that's been the custom. You don't talk to someone. That's just a topic you can't discuss. But I think that's the only mistake you can make. And sometimes you might not be the person to have that conversation uh, if you're really close to them. That may be hard for them sometimes, or it may be easier. It depends on the relationship. Sometimes you might have to get a close friend or a co-worker uh, or someone their age. But um, when I go to these schools, by the way, and I'm, I'm everyone's grandfather, right? They don't, they don't know this grandfather. And they hear my talk, and so they know I'm candid about it. And then kids will come up. Sometimes they tell me about what's going on. Sometimes they don't. And, you know, particularly if they don't look like they're in good shape, I'll say to them, how are you doing? How are you doing? It's okay. How are you doing? Uh, and sometimes that's really powerfully important. That's all it takes. Or i got to be honest, I'm concerned about you. You know, we love you, and I'm just worried about you. And there's no shame here, by the way, in this conversation. So uh, I just want to help you. I just want to talk to you. Uh, and sometimes people will open up just on that. Usually it's the person who's afraid to ask the question that makes the result what it is, which is I, I probably think that's too awkward. I won't mention it. And therefore, maybe I'm not saying what I'm saying. The only mistake you can make is not talk about it or not try. And you may have to try more than one time, or you may have someone else try. Um, in the workplace, uh, you need to have a user-friendly culture. And I would just recommend, by the way, for people 
on this uh, call today. If you Google uh, the Starbucks uh, CEO and mental health or Cisco CEO and mental health, Cisco has 75,000 employees. Both of those CEOs have taken major steps in the workplace to finally bring mental health into the open, to talk about it, uh, to normalize it, to get people the help they need, to educate their managers and supervisors uh, so they know what it is. Uh, businesses, and I suppose that includes law firms, obviously, businesses in this country lose upwards of $200 billion, with a B, every year because of mental health and substance misuse. And that doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and a lot of that is because you train people who have issues and they don't stay on. Or a lot of people with those issues, they or their family members have them. And so they take a lot of absent days. More people miss work, by the way, for mental health reasons than any other cause. Um, where you have people with those issues and they're working in your law firm or in your business, and they're there pretty much on a regular basis. But because of their own mental health concerns or the concerns they have for someone they love, it's like they didn't show up two and a half days a month. You're paying them, but they're not very productive. So it's called presenteeism. You're there, but you're not. So I encourage people to err on the side of trying and, and not finding it too awkward. You may save lives if you do that. And it's always a risk someone would be offended. But if you're concerned about them, it's a risk worth taking. We don't talk about it. Nothing will change. We need to reach out. We're not judging people. We're trying to help people. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for, I think, maybe one more question. Is that all right, Judge, before you have to get back to your mediation? Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Well, on the same kind of note as what you just ended with, you know, we're talking about reaching out to people and helping. And one of the specific questions posed in our event platform earlier is where can people get training for things like this, especially if it's going, if they're going to involve themselves in a professional capacity, if we're trying to change the stigma in law firms and at law schools, what kind of training do you know of that's available right now? Or is there not any available? And is that the problem? Uh, there actually is a very good program that exists, I think, in every state. It's federally funded. And it's referred to as Mental Health First Aid. And it's about six or eight hours of training. Uh, so the people who are there at the sessions learn a whole lot about mental health, what it looks like, um, how to deal with it, how to talk about it, uh, how to know when you have to elevate the discussion to a trained professional. But we, uh, you know, there are a lot of Americans who know how to do the Heimlich maneuver, right? And the number of times in your life you're going to see someone who's choking are very few. But so it's a good thing that we know that. But one in five people you pass has a mental health problem. They could be in your own house. They could be in your own family, your own workplace. Um, so I think it's really smart to learn about it and to get trained about what it is and to learn what resources may exist in your area. Uh, and in large businesses, the HR department needs to be all over it. And you know, uh, mental illness is protected by the ADA. So that may be a violation of federal law if you don't know what you're looking at. So I, I think you can look at your local community mental health centers, the local departments in your states of health and human services, your local health departments in your cities and towns, uh, mental health first aid is a great program. It'll make you a much wiser person. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and I do want to point out for our attendees that we do um, we do have uh, that last slide that we had in part of Judge Broderick's video, the REACT. Um, information that was provided to us in a PDF pamphlet form. So it is available for download from the Whova platform in association with this presentation. Um, Judge Broderick, I know we're running out of time to have you here, um, but is there any other thing, any other last words that you'd like to leave us with before we log off? The only thing I would say, I look at the answers to these questions, 
you or someone you know experience mental health struggles, uh, according to the survey, uh, the people who answered, they were unanimous uh, that they do. That should tell us all we need to know. Uh, if you ask people if they or someone they know has ALS, you wouldn't get 100%. And it's not that ALS is a critical illness, but it's not as common as mental illness. It doesn't affect as many lives directly and indirectly as mental illness. And treatment is possible. And lawyers, uh, who I greatly respect, uh, are amazing people. And they have a great moral center. And what we're doing now is not adequate and it's not even morally right. So I encourage people to speak up and reach out. We can change it. Or we can kick the can down the road and let another generation suffer in the shadows. I, I don't want to do that. I'm off that team. I want change to happen. So whatever you can do to help, I'd be grateful. Thank you so much, Judge. Uh, we will let you get back to your mediation. We do appreciate the fact that you took time to, to join us today. Um, as a, just again, the uh, information on the pamphlet is available in the Whova app. And um, we, you know, if you would like any additional information on Judge Broderick's work with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center up in uh, New Hampshire, please send me a message. I do have some information from his team. I'd be happy to share with everyone. Um, so with that, uh, thank, thank you, Emily, and thanks to all of you who took the time. Um, and I, I hope it touched you at some level so that you'll start to do something different tomorrow than you did today as it relates to this. Anyway, thank you very much.